All right, thank you everybody. Welcome back to day two of the Cambridge Disinformation Summit. This morning we're gonna start with a project that I was interested in because my personal observation when I was looking at the six elements that I articulated that I perceive with respect to disinformation, two of the things I thought were the least talked about were who are the malign actors and what are their incentives? In other words, what are their benefits? So I decided perhaps we could talk about the profiteering, the business side, if you will, of disinformation. I'd like to introduce our facilitator for this panel, Henry Friedman. He's a colleague, Associate Professor of Accounting at the UCLA Anderson School of Management. His research examines how information is produced and used in firms and capital markets relating to financial incentives, price formation, managerial expropriation, and investor beliefs. Thanks for coming in. All right, thanks everyone, and good morning and welcome. Uh, it's good to see everyone back again. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed the movie last night. I know that was really eye-opening for me and for a number of people who were there, and, and the Q&A was, was really exciting as well. So I'm thrilled to be joined by three expert panelists in the area. Uh, as Alan just said, I'm an accounting professor. I'm joined by three people who know a lot more about things I know very little about, so I'm gonna hope, hopefully uh, be able to draw some interesting insights by just asking simple questions that will allow them to talk about their work and their experience. So uh, first off is Emma, who's an associate professor of news and political communication at Monash University, an associate at the Cambridge Judge Center for Financial Reporting and Accountability. Uh, Der Spiegel in 2023 called her one of the world's leading experts in information wars. She's an internationally recognized expert and scholar of information warfare and propaganda who's testified to legislatures internationally, written books on propaganda and counterterrorism, and also disinformation uh, in the space of refugees and refugee policy. She's written multiple academic and popular press articles and is a co-editor of the Rutledge Handbook on the Influence Industry, which I think is really near and dear to the topic of this, uh, this summit. Uh, Marie Rose Santini on the left, is an associate professor at the School of Communication at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. She's a founder and director of NetLab, uh, where she coordinates academic research, teaching, and outreach activities between university and civil society in monitoring political campaigns. She's written books on the algorithm of taste and is a PI on research projects involving computational propaganda and the media, the media ecosystem regarding environmental issues, land use, and indigenous people's rights. Finally, Josh is an associate professor of journalism at UMass Amherst. He's an expert on sociological questions surrounding media distribution, widely published in journalism and communications journals, and as I mentioned, an expert on media distribution as well as digital advertising, co-editor of Distribution Matters, a, a series of books by the, put out by the MIT Press, and a founding member of the Culture Digitally NSF Working Group. So let's, uh, before we start, let's please give them a round of applause and, and welcome them for sharing their expertise. Thank you. All right, so uh, at this, su this uh, time here today, we're gonna be focusing on profits from disinformation. As some of you may know, or may be aware of, profits from disinformation totaled about 100 trillion last year. No, that's not right at all. 100 trillion was roughly global GDP, but hopefully that got you to pay a little bit more attention you know, I thought we'd start off with a little bit of disinformation to try and capture your attention before we dive into <laughs> stuff that's actually true. Okay, so uh, starting off with Emma, based on your work, and I'm gonna be asking this question of each of you, who have you seen and, and how have they been profiting from disinformation? Um, well, many of you will already know that um, I was involved in exposing the Cambridge Analytica scandal a few years ago. Um, but that was just one part of like a, a much wider body of work that I have um, been developing over many, far too many years at this point um, uh, to be able to actually have a proper night's sleep. <laughs> and um, I would say, you know, my main focus has been on conflicts um, and war propaganda. I started studying this, um, looking at what governments do during the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts um, and the way that war is spun. I've looked at the refugees that are um, smeared in the process of, of um, 
uh, you know, political campaigns uh, in order to, you know, win votes. Um, and, you know, more recently have been looking at, like, the actors that are, you know, very financially involved in this. Now, of course, you've got the media involved in um, spreading falsehoods about refugees and so on and in politics and in war and this has been going on for many years and that is a profit-making industry. So we, um, you know, making a profit off um, propaganda, um, as I like to pretend generally call it, is nothing new. Um, but as we've as I've, um, you know, watched in the last sort of 15 years or so, there has been a multiplication and acceleration of the profitability of propaganda. Um, there, this was partly precipitated by the war on terror and the massive amounts of government contracts that there were and investment in technologies to um, enable, you know, data gathering and uh, networked kind of uh, distribution, as well as um, an ability to, you know, intervene in trying to prevent recruitment by terrorists and so on. Um, but it also then, of course, um, was fed by, you know, huge investments in, um, you know, uh, politics, you know. So, um, for instance, in the Cambridge Analytica case, you had these, uh, this company that moved between politics and war according to what was more profitable at the time. Um, and we have the reproduction of um, these defense technologies in uh, political campaigns, uh, weaponized against, let's face it, the most vulnerable very often. So um, during that period, you've also got the massive expansion of infrastructure uh, around, you know, like platforms that were able to increasingly monetize data to accelerate, um, you know, um, uh, their own profits through, um, you know, um, anything that uh, is engaging online. I will let my um, colleagues here who um, spend a lot more time focused on these platform technologies, ad tech and so on, um, talk a little bit more about that. I don't want to take over, but um, that is my broad focus. And it's a multi-billion dollar, it might not be trillion, but it, it's certainly multi-billion dollar industry at this point. Yeah, well, at least that's a fact. Right? Yeah. That, that's a, a realistic number. So th thank you for that. Uh, Josh, can you comment a little bit on how firms and individuals have maybe profited indirectly from disinformation, as, as you've seen in your work? Um, so I, I mean, I've, I can kind of tell the, the story about how I initially got interested in this. It was um, right after the 2016 election in the United States. Um, you may recall there were a number of uh, like exposés in the news about you know uh, recent college graduates or teenagers in Macedonia or uh, unemployed journalists who are making um, you know decent chunks of money somewhere in the neighborhood of like thirty thousand dollars was a common figure, um, basically running digital ads against hoax news stories. Um, and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the, that reporting and a lot of the subsequent like scholarship looked at sort of um, you know were those you know could this have swayed the election were people persuaded about this why did why did they share these things um, but I'm used to studying infrastructure I'm really fascinated with like media distribution systems and so on and so my question initially was kind of an, like an infrastructure question I was like who are the intermediaries who are creating this really lucrative <laughs> you know, uh, these really lucrative incentives for the spread of this sort of hoax information. And when I say lucrative, I should bracket that because obviously $30,000 is not nearly enough to run a news organization. Um, but if you spent an hour in Photoshop and WordPress throwing together Pope endorses Trump or, some, or uh, I found uh, uh, like ballots in Ohio, um, you know, that's actually a huge payday, right? So the incentive structures are very asymmetrical, which is something that that's kind of concerning. But uh, so I spent the next uh, couple of years talking to people at different um, ad tech firms, basically, um, about sort of what they do and what responsibility they may or may not feel for, for, this, kind of, um, for this kind of arrangement. Um, and what I kind of, uh, and so I think I can just, you know, quickly give an overview of sort of like why, about how this works. So, um, uh, there are multiple forms of this, but I'll also go with what's called real-time bidding. It's a form of, what, what, uh, I'll, to use my last jargon term for the moment, uh, what people call programmatic advertising. Basically, every time you load a web page, 
there is an auction going on for your attention, right? So in the milliseconds the web page takes to load, um, the, the publisher is telling uh, a whole suite of advertisers, um, we have this user who's about to load this page, here's, uh, and, and, you, based on the, and here's the data about them so that you know, you know sort of who, so you can know who they are and sort of what their characteristics are, maybe how, and, and the, the advertisers will bid to place an ad in front of you based on what they know about you as an individual user. And by the time the page is finished loading, the winning, ad, the winning uh, like advertiser is the one whose ad you see. And this is all automated, um, so it's, it, and, and it happens an enormous number of times every hour <laughs> on the web, right? So we're talking like billions and billions of these transactions going on all the time. And uh, because it's automated, it has to be done through a bunch of platforms, a bunch of digital intermediaries. Um, and and that, that system basically uh, means that it makes it, it creates two major problems. One is uh, it, it makes it somewhat opaque for advertisers as to where their ads are actually going. So if you run the hoax news website and you put up ad space, they're not necessarily aware that their ad is going to appear there, and that's how you can monetize your disinformation site or your, or your, your hoax site, I'll call it, um, and, or your hate site for that matter. Um, and at the same time, uh, that, that act of, like that, like sort of the main value proposition for advertisers is the ability to target you as an individual at the moment that they feel that you're the most likely to buy something, right? We all know about all the surveillance and tracking that goes on on the web and increasingly on our mobile devices and so on. And so when the value is all centered around like sort of getting you, the user, that they want at the best price, the, this idea of contextual advertising, the context in which the ad appears and the value of that kind of fades into the background for advertisers a lot. They're not as concerned about which site they're running on. Um, we're no longer in the world where to reach people who are runners, you have to place an ad in a running magazine. Now, they, they, they know you're, based on what they know about you, they want to get you wherever they can at the cheapest price, right? This has changed a little bit as there's been activism and that sort of thing around this. But basically, all this means that there's a lot of opportunities for people to monetize like sm small and shady sites that are hawking um, disinformation. And so, uh, and if you can get those sites to go viral, all the better. And so, um, and we, so we, as we moved into, like away from the era of sort of search engine optimization into the era of social optimization, things that were inflammatory, that spread widely, that got lots of people to click back through to your site where you could display your ads, became profit centers, basically. Um, and so that's sort of the backdrop for this. That, um, and and I'll, I'll cut it there. I mean, there's more to be said, but I'm happy to take it later. We'll follow up on it soon. Uh, so, so building on that potentially, Marie, what, what have you seen in your work either on the academic side or in the, the policy work you've done with NetLab? Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. I ask the audience to be patient with me because I'm not a native speaker, okay? So if I make some mistakes, please, I can repeat or whatever. My colleagues will help me. Um, there is something very important happening in Brazil now because we are trying to, to regulate uh, platforms because of the disinformation phenomenon that is very impressive in Brazil. Um, and the, what happened now is that these platforms, they offer less transparency uh, in Brazil, I think in Global South. They do not respect local uh, laws. I can give you examples. Uh, in Brazil, we have, uh, um, um, 10 years ago, we have a law that regulates internet that says that the, um, how can I say, the service, the internet service are not responsible for content. Uh, but it's a 10 years ago law that is, of course, it's, update, it's not updated because the phenomenon of disinformation was not the same as it was now. So they uh, use this, this uh, old law to say that they are not responsible for anything, for any content in, in online platforms. I'm talking about ads, I'm talking about users' content, everything. So, uh, and they invest less in, moder uh, how can I say, content moderation teams and AI that can recognize Portuguese, for example. So, uh, the phenomenon of disinformation on online platforms in Brazil probably are higher uh, uh, and more dangerous than it's in 
Global North. And these platforms behave in a very aggressive way uh, this year, for example, because uh, in Brazil, we are trying to approve a, a bill that can regulate it, uh, in some way these platforms inspired in the DSA in Europe. And what Google did uh, this year was a, a very impressive um, because, for example, in the day before the voting, Google displayed a link in their front page saying that if this bill is approved, the internet in Brazil was in risk. It was one thing that they did. The other thing is that they start to uh, manipulate the, um, the search results, uh, saying that it was a censorship uh, bill. They, they did a blog, the, the CEO of Google did a text in their blog, and this uh, link was the first results and when you search anything about this bill, in all the cases, we did a lot of experiments about that. They were uh, running ads in an opaque way, not only in their platforms, but in Facebook, in Spotify. Spotify, for example, says that they don't accept political ads, and they were running ads from Google, so... <coughs> sorry. When you were um, listening to Spotify, then they stop, and then you start to listen uh, an ad saying that if this bill is approved in Brazil, uh, the internet is in risk and everything that you really like in internet will end. So this is some examples of what they're doing in Brazil uh, that I think it's very important that a global audience uh, to be aware about that. And I can talk more about... Um, ah, there's another thing that they did. Uh, YouTube has a YouTube studio for the creators that wants to upload their videos there, and they displayed a link saying that if the bill was approved, everything they have, this way of income, and the, their audience, their followers, they will lose everything. So it's some examples that w what they are doing in Brazil, but I can talk more about um, other cases. Cool. Also, ju just a heads up for, for the audience, we're going to shoot to have about 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes for, for Q&A. So we're, we're doing good so far. We've still got time. Uh, so, e Emma, I just want to follow up a little bit on what Josh was talking about and maybe if you could comment on how the ability to, to target individual users has changed the kind of disinformation and, and profitability of disinformation for the actors that you've been most focused on. <clears throat> Sure, so um, disinformation is just one part of an influence operation. You've also got the data operations that are going on behind it as well. And there are many, many different actors involved. So, um, you know, and that's uh, partly to silo the activities because if you're a firm like Cambridge Analytica, you don't want to have, you want to have deniability if, um, you know, some, somebody's email gets hacked. Um, so, for instance, like, uh, companies like this might receive information from another entity that was involved in that activity, and maybe that entity is abroad, and um, you know, they haven't been working with them directly. They wouldn't have hired them because you know, they um, you know, need to be able to say, actually, no, we, we don't know anything about this, and so on. So campaigns, like influence operations are highly coordinated with lots of different arms, and that doesn't, you know, those arms may only, you know, um, uh, tan tangentially connect, um, and yet the whole coordinated operation works together to, you know, in a, a highly organized way. Um, you have um, things happening like uh, that also mean that, that uh, the media might be profiting. So in the case of Team Jorge, which is the uh, Israeli internet firm that was, um, uh, you know, hacking firm that was implicated in the Cambridge Analytica scandal, as revealed last year, um, this uh, company was reported to have um, uh, been feeding information to the, um, uh, to a, uh, uh, a, a um, a French broadcaster. The French broadcaster puts out this, you know, information that, uh, by the way, they were caught on, uh, this company was caught on uh, camera talking about how they hack into people's emails and so on. So 
these companies obtain information. They may well get it out through the press, through a, a broadcaster or whatever. And then, of course, all of the bots, um, all of the you know, fake accounts come into play to boost that particular um, piece of material. You then have, like, let's say, Cambridge Analytica type firms. So once which Cambridge Analytica's whole business model was around like the targeted advertising that we talk about, like with Facebook and so on. But across platforms, many different platforms, and what they would do is to, um, you know, uh, do their own experiments um, to narrowly um, work out just who are the people that they can activate. When I say activate, I mean, you know, make you want to click things, share things, you know, act turn out for a, a, a rally or something like this. So, so actually act on what you're looking at online. Uh, watch a video on YouTube and comment and maybe make hateful comments or something like this. So these, um, they, you know, uh, uh, do experiments to isolate who are the people that um, are most likely to be activated. And of course, a lot of this tends to be around fear paranoia, who are the most fearful people? So Cambridge Analytica were looking for neurotics. They then put, upload a, a list of neurotics people to Facebook and, uh, you know, using F Facebook's custom audience feature. And then Facebook goes off and finds lookalike audiences. So they are able to then find, like, the very narrowly most likely to be triggered people on the internet, and then of course you've also got if it is a if it, if what you're sharing is a conspiracy theory video, you then have you know, like as we saw last night, YouTube also then recommending it to, to everybody that gets goes down that rabbit hole. So it becomes a narrower and narrower and narrower um, selection of people that you are targeting this to. And if you're in a, if you're looking at trying to influence a swing state um, at the right time. And I think that could be very powerful. And we need to be really thinking very carefully about not just the falsehood, the disinformation, but actually how surveillance capitalism is, um, you know, enabling the um, uh, asymmetric, um, you know, undermining of our rational able ability to um, to judge what what we are seeing online. Um, and, you know, our ability to actually make decisions um, that aren't emotional. Uh, they essentially are weaponized to um, reach our very most, you know, our, our weakest moments and our, you know, they know so much about us that, um, you know, we have no way of conceptualizing how much these companies know. Okay. And just following up very briefly on that, the ability to influence the outcome in a swing state, for instance, yeah. in the U.S. And for, for those of you who aren't from the U.S., a swing state is a state where the election is very, very close and can go either way. So it's, it's marginal, effectively, and, and pushing it a little bit in either way can change who's in power for the next several years. Yeah. So that, that's, a, that's a situation where if someone has the ability to do that and to exploit and potentially in their toolkit is exploiting disinformation, yep. that's where the, the profitability can be made for someone like Cambridge Analytica or another Absolutely. one of these for-profit facilitators of, say, power. And they are profiting not just from being, you know, obviously getting paid to do a service for a campaign, but they may well be, you know, Cambridge Analytica also worked on PACs. Now, there was a lot of concerns being raised about, like, the fact that there could have been coordination going on there, uh, which were being investigated. But you also have, you know, other actors um, around all of this that might be operating in more... Um, you know, subversive ways. I, I talked about hacking, uh, you know, entities that are able to, to do that. Usually it might be a based abroad. But you have um, Steve Bannon, who is going to be, by the way, um, on trial next year uh, in, in May. And like a number of his um, accomplices have been, you know, recently imprisoned for fraud around, um, you know, the Stop the Wall, uh, Build the Wall campaign and, and so on. And, you know, these things um, are easily monetized in the United States due to the amount of dark money flowing in politics. 
So, you know, there's um, Senator Whitehouse has been pushing for the Disclose Act to try to curb the amount of dark money. But we have the same kinds of things happening in Europe, and, you know, um, there needs to be a lot more focus on accountability and financial reporting, and, and this is why this is such an important event that we're at today. Um, anyway. yeah. so, so, Josh, following up on that, in the media space, how easy is it to tell, easy or hard, and I, I have an idea of where the answer is, but I, I'd like to hear from you, how easy or hard is it to figure out who is profiting from disinformation? Mm, the, um, so, I mean, if, if you're talking, so I, I mean, the, I guess there's a, different, a few different ways to potentially take the question. Um, I mean, if, if you're talking about, like, sort of how easy is it to figure out sort of who's standing up these sort of like hoaxes or um i mean that can be uh, that can be quite difficult because um these are people who can like you know shut down one account and create a new one the next day oftentimes they'll have many domains in reserve because they anticipate being like uh, being shut down and so on um so so and and the uh, in terms of like from a user's perspective telling whether something is fake or not um you know one of the big uh, one of the big issues was uh, has been sort of the fact that you know most links look the same in the social media spaces where you're uh, where, where you're clicking through to them, um, so it, uh, and mo and oftentimes the mobile sites will look much more similar to a legitimate news site than the desktop will. So if you're so basically they're less. Um, so if you pull up one of these horrible WordPress blogs or whatever that's very clearly hacked together. Um, you know, it might not be quite as obvious initially on the mobile device. It'll at least let keep hook you in long enough for them to run an ad. <laughs> so, fair enough. And then in, in in what you've seen, Marie, you, you've already talked a bit about how, for instance, Google and YouTube are getting involved in the the policy discussions. So, would you care to expand a little bit on that, and maybe how much they're doing that's that's observable, how much they might be doing that's not directly observable? We talked a we talked a little bit yesterday about how in, in the U.S. you can often tell who, who are the major public companies who are involved in, in XYZ, who are profiting from a given you know, regular economic activity, but that can be harder uh, in, in other parts of the world. So can you comment a little bit on both the ability to trace who has economic interests, but then also whose economic interests are being represented in policy decisions? Yeah, okay. I think it, the problem is that uh, internet and online platforms, they guarantee anonymity uh, for all the actors, and including the, the, uh, the, the big techs. So it's a problem because we can monitor and identify a lot of ads, a, a, a clearly campaign against, for example, this bill, or an electoral campaign completely um, um, designed with disinformation narratives, but we can't identify clearly who is paying for that because these platforms guarantee anonymity at the same time scale. So it's a lot of content, billions of uh, content, and it's a completely de deregulated environment. So it's very um, hard to identify and uh, completing the situation, they do not give us transparency. So we don't have transparency about their recommendation systems. We don't have transparency about who pay for the ads. We don't have transparency about the, the, the users behind fake accounts and things like that. And when the justice, for example, ask for, for data in Brazil, they refuse to give, they don't give, and they, they um, impose them a fine, and they prefer to pay the fine than to uh, send the data about these users because their business model is uh, depends on that. So it's very hard to identify. And in Brazil, I think that uh, these companies, we, we have a lot of uh, news report about that, they are involved with the far-right congressmen. Uh, of course, it's news articles. We can't prove exactly, but we know that they are uh, investing uh, in NGOs, they are investing in think tanks, they are investing in congressmen, and they are investing in researchers too. 
So uh, sometimes it's, it's public, but it, it's, it's, it, they are trying very hard to avoid any regulation in Brazil, even when it becomes public. Thank you. So, so Emma, what, what have you seen uh, in terms of companies that have been profiting from disinformation doing things to help to protect their ability to, to profit from disinformation? And, and that can range from you know, discouraging people like you from finding information about them to you know, getting involved with their, their legislative friends, things like that. Yeah, and also just the opacity around the companies. So, you know, um, in the United States, for example, they don't have this database that we have in the UK called Companies House, where you can see the, you know, um, you need access to be able to um, uh, see the be beneficiaries, of, uh, be beneficial owners of, of companies and so on. And, uh, you, but even in the UK, this data isn't complete enough. We need more transparency around these businesses. And um, I've seen, you know, examples where companies are set up just for the purposes of a, an influence campaign. Um, and, you know, unless somebody makes the um, Information Commissioner's Office, who, the regulator in the UK for data, um, aware of uh, a company, um, you know, working with data, then actually, you know, they, they get away with it, basically, you know. Uh, somebody needs to be, um, you know, alerted to the fact that, you know, there might be some kind of abuse of data going on in order for there to be act. So the compliance side of it is difficult. But also in, in the United States, I mean, there's, very, there's such um, opacity around this and the use of data as well, you know. Um, we need much better knowledge of what, you know, surveillance activities and so on are going on. Um, you have things like uh, bags of money going under the table, uh, paying for, for campaigns. Um, you know, and, and like I said, the, the, the um, siloed activities also is a way of hiding. Um, but, you know, there's also the intimidation of researchers and of journalists. Um, look at the you know, um, uh, what's going on in the US Congress right now with um, uh, researchers being asked to testify on, you know, um, uh, misleading um, claims about their, uh, about what they've been doing with their research on disinformation and so on. And um, it, it really is designed to silence people. Um, and I've experienced this kind of thing myself. You get death threats, you get, um, you know, uh, also data laws being weaponized against um, journalists and academics. You get hacking. Um, and, of course, if, if a hacker has obtained uh, information, then, you know, they're going to be very selective about what they put out. They're not fact-checking this, are they, you know? So, um, the, but at the same time, these kinds of um, campaigns might be, uh, or, you know, um, operations might be very um, put out in a very engaging way to look reliable information and so on. So it, it can be very difficult for people to know what to trust. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of efforts to try to make these uh, platforms more transparent. Most of these have been focused on trying to get researchers' data um, for like um, the Twitter API, for example, which obviously is going to be incredibly difficult now. <laughs> Elon Musk is, uh, is there. But um, so, uh, you know, uh, really, actually, what we need is far deeper information. We need more information about decision making. We need to have a process similar to freedom of information where we can require them to actually give us transparency information. Um, and of course, you know, corporate. Um, incentives go against that. So we need legislation to be able to do that kind of thing around transparency. Um, but, you know, also I would say that uh, there are incentives in uh, the media that are not helping this. So, um, for example, we have, um, you know, The Guardian and, and, and a lot of other mainstream journalists have not really been covering um, propaganda of our own governments. And that has left a void that Russia is filling with incredibly misleading, you know, accounts of what our governments do. And, you know, that, because people, there's always going to be a desire to learn about these things, um, we absolutely need, you know, journalists to actually be looking at 
uh, this kind of activity and presenting reliable you know, um, information for the public about this kind of thing. We need much more transparency that, you know, um, because a lot of the time when um, kind of propaganda or activities of our governments are talked about, it, you know, they are emphasizing things that actually aren't really that nefarious. Um, but we're not even hearing about the things that we really need to know about and actually have a public debate about. So I think um, you know, the, the lens of, of Russian disinformation is distorting this kind of thing. And journalists who might feel like, well, is there really a story here? Ne they have an obligation to actually help to fill those data voids that uh, get exploited as well by, by foreign governments um, and, and anybody wishing to you know, mislead us. So, it, you know, it's, it's often said that sunlight is the best disinfectant, yes. but fortunately, most of us don't have to pay for sunlight, whereas if we want to have an effective yep. uh, journalism sector, an effective inf true information product production sector, you know, there are incentives, there are actual costs, there, there's incentives that are necessary, there's actual costs that have to be borne. So, so turning, turning to Josh, you talked a little bit about the, the magnitude of costs, the magnitude of profits for, for disinformation. I, I was wondering if you could expand on that and maybe how that's changed the, like the business models for traditional journalism or, or the production of, of real true information mm -hmm. or the, the incentives to, to go and, like, do people outside of academia have strong incentives to shine a light on, say, uh, a fake website that's producing disinformation if they're just going to shut down and pop up with a slightly different name shortly mm -hmm. after and, you, and, and it becomes difficult to trace that? Yeah, so I mean, it's, it, the, to get, get to the initial sort of part of your question, um, the, uh, I mean, basically, journalism for many years in like in commercial journalism ecosystems, like uh, like the one in the U.S. and and partially the one here in the U.K., um, you know, obviously it depended on what we now what are it's called contextual advertising. You know, so basically, as I mentioned earlier, if you want to reach runners, you put your ad in the running magazine. If you want to reach a local audience, you put your ad in the local newspaper. Whether you're, sell, you're talking about a classified selling your lawnmower or you're the local department store or something like that. And now, um, like sort of, we're able. To, uh, companies are able to uh, place uh, through these ad tech systems. Uh, companies are basically able to place their ad on anywhere, and still get the person who's local, still get the person who fits the demographic that they're interested in. Um, and that's put enormous downward pressure on the price of advertising, right? Because now newspapers aren't just competing against the other newspaper in town, and there rarely was one. Um, and now they're also competing with recipe sites and gaming apps, and also, and basically anybody who wants to just who wants to include like an ad widget on their site. So, um, so basically. And that's driven ad prices down into the basement, um, and you know, uh, local newspapers. You know, people will say that they have less audience than they, did, than they used to. In many markets, even if they had everyone in their locality, right? Ads are now so cheap that they can't make what they used to on ads. It's still insufficient. And then you compound this with the problem of like the massive amounts of ad fraud. And this is kind of interesting. Like, this is one of the more interesting things that I found out looking into this, which was that. You know, when I began asking about the monetization of like hoax news sites, one of the first things that people in ad tech told me is what you're really talking about here um, is, is actually, uh, they saw it as a form of ad fraud. And so the, the, the average ad fraud scheme, it, it works like this, basically. You buy fake traffic, so bots and, and so on, and, um, or, or click workers in developing economies. And you and you uh, and basically, so you're you're buying fake page views or fake impressions on your your site, and then you turn around and you sell them on these automated um, in these automated ad auctions um, for more than you paid for them. So you're selling um, you're selling robots, <laughs> robotic traffic to automated exchanges, um, and and basically and, and in theory, there's no need for humans in this equation, right? You can just turn on the machine and let it run and it makes money for you. Um, except there are like mechanisms for detecting that kind of fraud. Um, that if there's lots and lots of bot traffic, you need to sort of dilute it somehow with real humans. <laughs> and so while it's really excellent if for, your, for a hoax news publisher, if their um, hoax news site goes viral, um, and, and you get like all the headlines about the Pope endorses Trump or something like, along those lines, 
uh, or, or, or all the people um, sharing that story, really the day-to-day -day business of ad fraud is just drawing enough human traffic to disguise the number of bots that you're buying to view your site. So it's a really like weird and dystopian thing, but ad fraud of the, like uh, like due to, to automated traffic adds up immensely. Um, so I think the last figures from one of the reputable auditing firms, Human, which used to be known as White Ops, um, it was that uh, it was that basically um, advertisers are losing about six billion dollars annually um, to to, uh, to, ad, to to robotic traffic, and that's down. Uh, I th from even greater numbers um, in past years. So they've been like trying to rein it in and it's still an enormous figure. Um, so you know, it's, so it's, a, it's a persistent problem and, and, it's, uh, and it gets to the sort of like all, all of the weird like financial incentives that you, that you get in these underpinnings of the web and all the, the problems that journalism, journalists have, journalists, news organizations have enough trouble competing with other commercial news organizations, let alone the amount of money that's being siphoned out of the system through things like this. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting just to hear about the layers of disinformation. It's not just end users who are, who are being potentially deceived, but also the, the companies that are trying to put their products and services in front of actual people are being deceived about mm -hmm. whether, that's, whether that's happening with some of these uh, online ads. So I, I guess we, just as, as a last question or last comment before we go to, to open Q&A, uh, Marie, ha have you seen any shifts in the, the mix of information that, that is available to, to users in Brazil in terms of have things moved towards disinformation in the time that you've been monitoring, say, political campaigns? Has it gotten worse? Have things gotten, gotten better? Is, is there a trend that you've noticed? I think it's become worse each day. Uh, I will tell you a case that happened this week about ad fraud in Brazil, there is an epidemic of ad fraud, not only this kind of fraud that is a fake audience, but fraud uh, or ads that is a kind of scammer. So they just like say that, oh, come, in, come on, uh, I'm selling, it's not only selling false products, but uh, especially uh, finance solutions. So the depth, the depth of people, uh, vulnerable people are each day uh, higher because it's very common to these people to to click in this ad and then uh, to suffer uh, scammers. So l last week, the government in Brazil launched the program just to uh, decrease the debt. So the program is called Dizinhola, <clears throat> and this program is for vulnerable people to 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 um, to decrease their debt. And there's, there's an epidemic of ads using the name of the program, using the name of the government with false uh, websites to people to click there and then to, to buy a finance solution and they are increasing their debt. And so uh, we uh, did a report about that and the government based on our report just um, notified Google and Facebook saying that they need to not only to take down the ads, but each day the ads is online because the program will, um, uh, will be uh, running for one year, for more or less. So each day they, uh, there is online frauds using the government program. They will pay a fine and the ads are still online today, it was last week. So it's an example that they prefer to pay the fine than to uh, change their business model to moderate ads because maybe it's too costly, I don't know, but uh, it's, a, it's a big problem. Thank you. So, so over, over the past 45 minutes, I, th I think we've covered a lot of interesting and, and potentially saddening ways that various firms and individuals might be profiting from disinformation, whether it's to facilitate political power or power in general, whether it's to <clears throat> sell ads or sell products and services, facilitate ads, or, or to participate in scams. In my work on uh, financial information and investors, there's also quite a bit of disinformation aimed at more like Marie's example, taking money directly from individuals or, or investors with, by potentially offering returns that are too high or, or risk that is too low. So with that, I'd like to wrap up the, 
our part of the panel and, and open it up to, to Q&A. So as previous panelists have mentioned, it is kind of hard to see. I can't see the runners with the mics, but uh, if they can help sort of pick who's, who's going to be asking a question. It's, it's nice to line up who has a mic with who's going to ask a question. Um, so there's someone standing back. Hi, good morning. Sarah Crockett from Cambridge Judge. So thanks a lot for the discussion. Super interesting. I'm wondering, so there are a lot of calls about legislation, rules, we need more transparency about businesses and their activities. But then we also have these stories from Brazil in particular where companies just don't follow. They ignore the rules or they pay the penalties. So what do you think, do we have the capacity, so the resources, the expertise to actually ensure that, let's say we have rules at one point, that they are complied with? And maybe related to what extent are there like big players like Google or Meta, uh, to what extent could they undermine rules because they have more resources or more, more expertise? Thanks. Uh, can I? I think we need a global solution because internet is global. So uh, we have the DSA in Europe now but maybe the, these actors will, maybe no, I'm sure these actors will still act in, in, the, in a bad way, in a malicious way, outside Europe, but targeting Europeans. So uh, there is an DSA, but the problems persist. So I think it's very hard to, 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 to define a global solution, but I think it needs to be our goal. Would either of you like to... I mean, there, there's a broader issue of enforcement here also. And <laughs> there's variation in resources for different jurisdictions to enforce. There's variation in willingness to enforce. Uh, it, it's come up a little bit already, but would either of you care to comment further on it? I, I would like to say something about the digital influence mercenary side of this rather than the platforms. The, you know, this is a, a major Western export industry, and I think that's a really important thing to say. Um, there are lots of these com companies and other places, of course, um, but actually we have a lot more control over what Western companies do, yeah? And um, it is absolutely abhorrent that you have these companies um, able to, you know, do things abroad that would be illegal in the countries that they're operating in. Um, and I, I think, you know, we do not enforce standards enough on our Western companies where we actually can. Um, and I think, you know, having an ability to, you know, like extend, um, uh, you know, eth ethical standards within uh, our own borders where we have an influence is a really important starting point. And I want to make the point as well that um, this isn't just disinformation firms. Like, these are also big, reputable, supposedly, you know, well, I, I say reputable, but companies with a big reputation that are doing a lot of this kind of thing, actually, a lot of the time, you know, and that we are not regulating, we are not imposing, stuff. they have codes of conduct in, for instance, PR and, and, and advertising and so on, which often get like overlooked in favor of, you know, pleasing the client and the client's profits and so forth. And, um, you know, I think what we need to do is to be also not pretending that this is a small, you know, these are small actors that are not playing by the rules. This is a big industry that is heavily profitable in the West, exploiting, you know, places in the global South and their, their weaknesses as well. So I think that's really important. We need more regulation around what those firms are doing. Uh, next question. So, let's see, where, where are you going? Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for raising this issue. Uh, my name is Marina Doros, and I'm from Ukraine. I represent uh, IREX here. So indeed, uh, Russia has a very wide network of actors who are spreading its propaganda in different countries. Uh, according to one of the uh, research studies uh, which was conducted in Ukraine by Text.org UA, 
in 19 European countries, uh, they have found more than 900 organizations who are involved in some way in spreading propaganda. Different kinds of organizations, political, media, cultural. And uh, indeed, one of the main channels is um, social media. I think that um, I will have two questions. Uh, the first one, um, can you describe, like given your research and experience, the portrait of the institutions which are uh, most likely to be involved in Russian propaganda? And um, the second one, from what I heard from uh, you today, uh, you are quite pessimistic regarding the disclosure of uh, such actors and making them accountable. So can you confirm <laughs> that you are pessimistic in this? And maybe you have some optimistic examples and cases where actually it was possible to uh, uncover such organizations and make them accountable. Thank you. Is that for me? Uh, I guess this is for all three speakers. Uh, since you, Emma, uh, were talking about the um, portrait of the individuals who are uh, likely involved, so I guess maybe the first question is regarding the portrait of the institutions. It can be for you, but in general, it's for all speakers. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'd say, like, in, in general, in, in this panel, we've focused on profit based incentives for disinformation, whereas I, I think what, what what your initial, what your first question brings up quite saliently is not necessarily profit-based, but you know, just global power incentives. And, and of course, there could be like the mercenaries that you mentioned who are working sure. for Russia. Yeah. So, so maybe we can so talk a little bit about. There's plenty of those firms that yeah. work for you know, um, and, and you know, the United States has the Farah um, declarations of like um, lobbying. Uh, for foreign entities, um, which helps to make some of that um, uh, transparent. We haven't had similar legislation in the UK, and they're trying to introduce this. There's some problems around that kind of legislation, because it might um, uh, make it hard for uh, charities, for example, uh, to operate, and, and not charities like nonprofits and things. So there's some questions around how to frame that law. Um, where human rights organizations are concerned and things. Um, but yeah, we need regulation around lobbying uh, for you know, making this kind of thing more transparent. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of people profiting off this. I don't want to get into specific entities and get sued. <laughs> but um, you know, um, Russia uses a lot of uh, other entities that it may not necessarily finance, you know, directly pay, but, um, you know, actors might make money in other ways through, you know, advertising, through, you know, um, clickbait, the fact that, you know, they maybe, you know, have huge um, audiences that they can monetize and so on. Um, you also have, um, you know, um, YouTube influencers that have been found to be working for places like China and, and so on. So th there is a, a huge market of many different actors that are working for foreign governments. Um, I think also it's, it's worth noting that um, the ways in which this uh, can be uh, really um, uh, make us vulnerable as countries, the, the influence industry firms um, working for foreign states at the same time as working for our own militaries, for example. Um, I, I personally have argued that we should not have, you know, um, uh, companies that are both employed uh, by Western militaries and working for places like the Russians and so on. And um, if you look at um, Team Jorge in particular, that was a, a contractor that was working for US military. And it then was being deployed in the, all of these really uh, disturbing um, uh, election campaigns around the world. Same with Cambridge Analytica, all these kinds of firms. So I think we, we um, are naive to the ways in which the tools that we create can be weaponized against our democracies. and. Um, it doesn't necessarily also have to be um, v visible, the, the payments, okay? It's not, not necessarily direct. 
elections are a zero-sum game. You either win or you lose. So it, it, it's a high-stakes thing. It, they will put anything into winning an election because, by the way, um, if, a, if a company um, wins an election, they get then uh, the um, uh, contracts that flow from that for working for the government. They get other contracts within the, the country concerned and so on. So it snowballs from there and it's worth breaking rules. And I'll that over. I would like to compliment a case in Brazil about the U U U Ukraine war. Ukraine is very far from Brazil. We are very far from the war I issue because, um, well, because of the geographic situation and we don't have a close relation with Ukraine or things like that. But uh, the, day started, the, the day that started the war started a campaign in Brazil, a very strange campaign, pro-Russia. And we started to monitor that because we could not understand, and especially in the Amazon region. There is a big, very big region, but very far from the, uh, the, the center of Brazil, from the capitals, whatever. And we start to identify, and then we, we realize that uh, there is a company, a Russian company in Brazil called Rushnet, that is an oil and gas company that bought uh, 16 blocks in Amazon in the size of France, more or less, and they want uh, to approve, um, um, how can I say, a highway in this region because of their business. And what we know is that they financed this campaign, pro-Russia, uh, this uh, first month of the war because they wanted to, uh, to go ahead with this improvement, for example. And what we know is that uh, this pro-Russia campaign in Brazil is related to agribusiness. So it's only an example. And agribusiness normally have in-house teams that uh, run disinformation campaigns. It's not uh, third parts. Thank you. So in, in the interest of time, I, I think we should, we should wrap up. Uh, on the second question about pessimism or optimism, I'm going to strategically sidestep that one. Oh no, time's running out. Uh, but I, I do want to say, rather than being pessimistic or optimistic, I, I think we can make our own judgments about where we sit today in terms of these, these issues. But I think there's, there's just definitely a need to be tenacious and to be creative in trying to figure out let's just say solutions or ways to address the ability for disinformation actors to profit from their activities and to do so in a way that is, let's say, in the dark, out, outside of the disinfecting effects of sunlight. Anyway, in closing, please join me in, in thanking our panelists for sharing their expertise with us.